Hello, everyone, and welcome to Telecom TV's Super Panel from Barcelona. Thank you all for coming this evening at the end of what is yet another long day at Mobile World Congress. I'm Guy Daniels, Editorial Director at Telecom TV, and up for debate this evening, a 5G reality check, making the business case for 5G. We have five guests with us tonight and a couple of surprise guests from the audience from Vertical Markets. Um, I'm delighted that once again we are sponsored by Hewlett Packard Enterprise and Intel. This is in fact our 10th super panel. Our fourth one from Barcelona, but our, our tenth one. We are getting through these debates faster than the 3GPP gets through cellular generations. <laughs> oh, everyone loves an industry joke, and there's more of them coming. Um, speaking of which, with the industry gathering in Barcelona again for the annual MWC event, it's perhaps inevitable that our subject was going to be 5G. It is the topic of the year yet again, and no doubt will be the topic of the year for the next few years, but don't anyone dare mention 6G. Not even you, Mr. President. <laughs> We've got enough on our plate with 5G, haven't we? <laughs> um, in fact, we are well and truly at the point of broad cultural awareness of, of 5G now. Some of you may know of a radio station in the UK called Classic FM. It's very popular. Um, they've just started running some house ads on the radio. And believe it or not, to quote the actress in the house ad, she says, personally, I don't think we need another G. I've already got Gershwin. I've already got Guno. I've already got Glass. I've already got Goretzky. Oh, Grieg. How could I possibly forget Grieg? There's my five composers. You know, if a radio station for a mature audience, so classical music-loving people, is making fun and understanding 5G, then I guess we have really arrived at the you know, awareness and the point. 5G now is ready to go, even without handsets. You know, we, are, we are aware and uh, eager to go. So let's just go, shall we? Um, let's introduce our guests on stage. From my immediate right, yet again, once again, we have Caroline Chan, who is VP Data Center Group and General Manager of the Network Business Incubator Division at Intel. Thanks for coming along because you, your opinions have been shaping these super panels for a, a number of, of years now. Uh, next to Caroline, we have Mike Haberman, VP of Network Engineering at Verizon. Good to meet you, Mike. Thanks for joining us on the, the Super Pleasure Panel. Pleasure being here. Uh, next to Mike is Arno Vampires, who is Senior Vice President, Radio Networks and 5G Lead at Orange. Cool. And another regular guest, Robert, Robert Boyensky, VP Enterprise Mobility at AT&T. <laughs> <laughs> who, who is very shy in retiring. <laughs> and next to Robert on the end, last but not least, is, is Justin Hotard, who is General Manager and SVP Volume Business at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Oh, no, no. <laughs> you know, usually on super panels, we have problems getting our message across to the audience because they're otherwise engaged. But I think tonight we, we've got their attention. The first commercial 5G networks are now being deployed. User devices, mobile devices are, are about to come to market. New digital services are about to launch. 5G is upon us. But there are questions about the business case that still need resolving. Let's, let's consider the case for investment first, if you can. Um, where do we see the biggest investments from CSPs and indeed enterprises in 5G infrastructure happening? Where are we going to see that initial big investment? Who would like to pop first? Mike, have, 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 a, have a sure. Pick a um, sure, I'll take that. At least I'll take a shot at it. Um, as far as the investment, um, you know, you're seeing a lot of investment currently in the 4G technology. So that is by far a complementary technology, and that's going to continue to grow. So that will be you know, something that will continue to do, continue to evolve, because as you know, as 4G evolves, it does have a path to 5G. Um, now, as far as investment in 5G in the business models, um, you know, we have invested. Um, we do have a commercial service um, that we offer. We call it 5G Home, um, and we're basically using the 5G link to provide the broadband connection. Um, so that's been one use case application that right out of the gates, um, it sort of made sense um, and as the technology evolves, you can uh, move it towards mobile as you move towards uh, 5G NR. Okay. Oh, no. 
Uh, like you mentioned by Mike, we are investing a lot as uh, Orange in um, 29 countries in Europe and Africa to enhance for fiber and 4G today. So when we look to 5G investment, we will add three uh, main applications. The first one, we will put 5G on top of 4G for enhanced mobile broadband. The second one, we will use it for fixed wireless access. We do think that on some area, it could be complementary to our fiber deployment. Uh, and last but not least, uh, we do believe that 5G is a real enabler for the digital transformation of our B2B customers. So we are working a lot there to see how, which kind of investment we can do for B2B premises for their digital transformation. Well I'm said. Um, I, I tend to agree there. In, uh, in business, AT&T business, we've invested in uh, our mobile network. We launched our 5G mobile network last, uh, last year uh, in 12 markets. Uh, we are very much uh, aligned on a fixed product for 5G. And then uh, a little bit different on the end of, of your statement, but I think the customers that we all talk to in the enterprise are looking for an edge compute solution. So we are in uh, early stages of deployment of our multi-axis edge compute solutions, which really unpacks these use cases that our enterprises are trying desperately to get to. And, and Justin, from the vendor's perspective, you know, where, where are we likely, from, from your views, to see this initial investment? I think it's pretty consistent with, uh, with what all of our customers you know, just highlighted, but I would say a couple of things. One is the infrastructure readiness, you know, all the way back into the core to be able to um, enable the applications and services that, um, that our customers run today to support these new business models or emerging business models. And then I, I see a lot of testing at the edge, um, and I would call it testing at the edge in the sense of trying to iterate with some of our collective enterprise customers and finding those business models, delivering that value proposition, figuring out the business case. Um, and it seems, you know, it, it, it's a, in many ways is what we see in many other parts of IT, which is an iterative approach, which I think is new for this industry, but very critical to, to long-term value creation in, in 5G. Caroline, do you have a pop at the investment? Yeah, so I think I, pretty much agree with everybody said that in starting the infrastructure, but the one key difference is that we notice uh, our end users start asking for not just infrastructure, but infrastructure that is upgradable, that's virtualized, that's more cloud native, and inherently carries the edge compute element. Uh, in fact, I'm really happy to say that uh, this week there will be an announcement coming out from a greenfield operator that builds a 100% cloud native network, 4G and upgradable to 5G, where every node is potentially a MET node. I think that brings a tremendous amount of uh, excitement to the industry. I just came from uh, ORAN Summit where uh, AT&T, Verizon, Orange are all on the board. And the idea to why it's an open network is important because it foster innovation. It, 5G, I would say, that it will welcome a different type of ecosystem, not the tech ecosystem that we have before. We need developers to come in and start developing applications. So that's why the whole concept of open and faster innovation, uh, edge compute, really comes into play. How will that impact investment from the service providers, having this wider, broader ecosystem? Mike. Is this going to make much difference to the, 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 your investment patterns um, by opening out the ecosystem and more players? I, I, I think when you look at it, um, certainly you can do stuff for your own, your own investment, but you certainly can open it to others. You can use it to third parties, and you could all open it also to other um, larger entities. Um, because when you think of something like MEC, it is prime real estate in terms of things you can do with it, the applications, the responsiveness. Um, the intelligence you could you could actually move out of the device if, if need be and make the devices cheaper. Right. Um, can we separate the edge from 5G in terms of network investment? No. I think, no? <laughs> Simple answer. <laughs> no, I think for us what um, What's happening right now when customers are asking about 5G, they bring us in, we just have a, a deep discussion about what the technology is going to do. And then when you get down into it and peel back some of the, the, the technology layers and the complexity, what they want more than anything is their own data, right? They want to manage their applications closer and closer. And the big industrial companies that we talk to um, have ultra privacy concerns. And the only way you can do that is you break that data down 
and do a local drop off and give it to them. And then where the applications come in, right, it's, be, it's in between where that MEC application is at and that privacy that they get and in between where that SDN layer is sitting at. So in between is where that development ecosystem is going to sit. And it's really a pathway, right? It's going from the current LTE product set, 5G evolution for us, into uh, 5G. And customers don't necessarily come in and talk to us about the bandwidth. They talk to us about their use case and what they're trying to do with it. And then you know, with different spectrum and different uh, technologies, we can add bandwidth as they grow. Um, yes, it's true that we have different demands from our B2B customer. It could be really on wide area networks when they look to uh, some class of services or more on the LAN uh, area, that means on the site, when they're really on-premises, want some, some solutions. So we need to, on this um, multi-service 5G connectivity, to really uh, design it from the beginning to give access on both sides, local and global. Come. I, I just Add that uh, with 5G, I think all of us need to take more risk. You know, they are always taking risk by investment. Uh, we also want to, to jump in. So I know I've been here a couple of times, and we always talk about industrial. Uh, those are very much valid retail. We've done quite a bit with both uh, all three operators here. Uh, recently, uh, we're just going to share with you off stage that with the Supreme Court the uh, penalized uh, sports wagering. So there was an announcement, in fact, I think my blog just went live today that National Hockey League decided to take that up. So when I looked at it, I don't see it as a sports wagering, I see it as a three principles. Why 5G and Edge is so go hand in hand. Data acquisition, data analytics, and data monetization. Before, they, what they did is they put in a sensor in the pucks and sensors in the players. They are now getting 2,000 data points per second. So somebody to capture all the data points, analyze the data points, and they put in, what they did is they're putting out real-time odds on the, the phones and iPads and saying, do you, you, they essentially take the data points and they overlay the video real-time on it. So anybody in the, uh, in the auditorium can bet. And what that happens is you have to do a secure transaction Right? You say, ready to bet, you push a button, you bet. What is that really? It is. It's a secure transaction. It's something you can very well apply to a fintech industry. So take that learning, take that example, apply to other verticals. This is what I, I think all of us need to do, is try more things, take more risk, and open up the 5G use cases. Then we can really talk about what is ROI. If I could add on to that, I think what's, what's unique and different and refreshing when, when we talk to the, uh, the ecosystem and all of our partners, um, they give us feedback that we're doing things differently now, and that's a compliment for us. We're not doing 18-month long-tail development and plunking a, you know, tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars of capital and hoping someone buys something. What we're doing is we're partnering with Intel, HPE, and a customer who has a real problem for an outcome that they want. And as we go through those pocks with these customers proving in the tech, then we peel off you know, our precious capital and build you know, our products out that way. Let's, um, let's, let's move on to some, uh, what we are now calling a quick fire round, where we're going to ask a very simple question. 60 second answers, so let's keep it as brief as possible. There'll be demerit points for those who go over 60 seconds. Um, I want to ask the question, what infrastructure do we see as essential at the aging core as we move to 5G? What, what are the essential infrastructure elements that need to be in place as we make the business case for 5G? And I'm, I'm going to start from my far left, so unlucky, Justin, you're okay. going to be number one. We're going to get our little clock going, and we're going to have a little 60-second timer. But the question to you is, you know, what infrastructure do you see as essential to make the business case of 5G? Well, I'd say the attributes of the infrastructure are what are, what are critical. We've got a clock. We've got a oh, countdown yeah. clock. It's a serious yeah. business. It's yeah. a serious I business. I just used five seconds to, to, to yeah, I used five seconds describing it. Um, so the, I think the attributes are critical, and, and, and what I mean by that is it's got to be virtualized. It's got to be, I think it has to be ubiquitous to some level, and you have to be able to abstract it up. I mean, if we think about the example of, a, of an enterprise user, they want to come in, they want, to sh they want their assurance on security, they want a cloud-like user experience to be able to deploy their application, and they want to have the flexibility to, to move that application depending on the business value. So maybe more in a core environment and maybe down at the edge. 
I think those are the attributes that I see as essential. I mean, obviously there's core building blocks in 5G, the radio technology, some of the other elements that are going to be necessary. But uh, the difference to me is this looks a lot more like a distributed virtualized IT network uh, than it does a, a traditional telecom network. Look at that. Look at that. Got it. Max that at that time, Robert. Robert. All right, cue the clock. Let's see yeah, how yeah. this goes. Um, so same to you. You know, what investments? Uh, what I think it's a lot essential? simpler than what my friend said. There it goes. Sixty seconds. Thanks. You need an HPE box sold to the customer, and then you need AT and T's VNF riding on it. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Look at that. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. <laughs> <laughs> With an Intel processor on the inside. Oh, too late, sorry. Sorry, you blew it. <laughs> Want me to replay it? I got 30 no, seconds to go. <laughs> oh, no, come on. Uh, what do you think? It's, yes, uh, we need a, a telco grade infrastructure. So um, we are operating as a range in 29 countries in Europe, Africa. We have more than 100 network elements today in each network. So when you look to that, we need, really need to industrialize, of course, we can do it with Intel, HP, and, and really build a, um, a telco grade. So, so it will take quite uh, some time and efforts for that. So we need a bit of defragmentation in our industry to achieve that. The second element I could share, if you want to sell this multi-service connectivity, especially for the digital transformation of our B2B customers, we definitely need to show what we are achieving. The SLA we can achieve, a service level agreement, so we need a bit of tool to be able to show what is the real quality we have achieved on our infrastructure. So if we mix the two, telco grade infrastructure and SLA tools, I think together we can create value for our B2B customers. Excellent. Even better. Even better. Yeah, Even, no better. Even better. Even better. No, no pressure at all, Mike, at all. But you know, I, uh, cer certainly, um, I'm more of an engineer, so you know, what's, what's required is you need to get fiber. You need to have deep fiber to be able to move around information. First thing you need. Um, second thing is you need to have space out at the edge, right? So our cell sites typically provides a lot of that space to enable it. And then you need to virtualize all the functions the network, the core elements, the control elements, really to bring that core from, from basically a centralized location in the mid part of uh, the United States out to the edge of the network in order to really give that latency it's required. And then of course when you do this, the most important thing um, is you need to be able to orchestrate it well, right? Because you need to know the applications, what they're designed, what they're trying to do, so those IT guys out there figuring out what IT applications and how they're going to be more efficient, you can do that with orchestration and having your distributed architecture. So it's a whole different dimension coming up. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Mission Impossible time. <laughs> Caroline, you have 60 seconds. <laughs> Starting from now. now. So uh, I think, first of all, us in the telco, I count myself in the telco, we started to thinking more like the IT, more like the cloud guys. Number one, common API. We have to run that common API so people do not write this over and over again. And then the other thing is, what about function as a service? Look at how the, uh, the cloud guys are offering their service. It's not that you buy it, you, this is, you have to pay for everything up front. It's, so we're spending a lot of time doing function as a service, enabling that, at the silicon level, the so security at the silicon level. Uh, I'm actually recently launching a, a project on blockchain on the edge. How do we ensure that the enterprise truly trusts the things we're moving? Because there's an inherent security concern. Think about the things that we're doing with that. Uh, you know, on the gambling side, has to be a secure blockchain. Oh. I did it! I did it! <laughs>